I, uh, thank you, Dr. That was very nice. Uh, thanks for inviting me. All right, so, so I'm going to do something a little different. Um, inspired by Vivek, actually, I'm going to try and ask you questions. We'll see how that goes. Um, but, I, you know, I'm going to be thinking about navigation in a slightly different way from what you've probably heard in the rest of this course, okay? Uh, so we're going to start with some ideas, and then we're going to move to data. We'll see which, which is best. Um, so this is a question that uh, I, I missed the first couple of days, so I don't know if anybody tried to ask you this question. Oh, yeah. But <laughs> how about <laughs> this question? <laughs> you know, in a nutshell, what, what, have we got a definition? Somebody want to give, give me a definition? What is navigation? From place A to place B. Oh, I, you, you must have seen <laughs> No, that's right. So that's, that's pretty good. Uh, so. It, but is it good enough, right? So if I, when I fly back to San Francisco, I'm, I'm going to be getting on a plane in Munich, actually, and uh, it's, it's going to fly, but it might, you know, think of all the flight patterns it could take. It could fly five times around the planet and then land in San Francisco. But I'd be pretty annoyed if it does that, right? So is there something else we want to add to this definition of getting from A to B? I like that optimal, and you were going to say the most efficient way. Well, I think you've seen all my slides already. Okay, so <laughs> the problem of getting A to B efficiently, right? So these are the actual uh, flight paths that the planes are taking, because they, you know, they're they're trying to um, minimize their costs. Their costs are fuel, right? So, uh, so that's pretty good. Maybe we could say getting from A to B by the shortest path. But that, that might not be quite general enough. Oh, here we go. Because the shortest path is, uh, is usually not the safest. Yeah, great. So uh, to introduce this final idea, I'm going to tell you a little uh, <coughs> story about this fantasy adventure game. So when I was eight years old, my parents bought me this game, and, uh, and, and I, I loved it. It was so complicated, and it's rather pointless, actually. It turns out to be kind of a boring game, but it's, the rules are incredibly complicated. Uh, and so I couldn't get anybody to play it with me. <laughs> and um, what I did was about six months ago, I bought it on eBay so I can play it. I have an eight-year-old son. And um, now he wants to play it all the time. And I, I really don't want to play it because it's really <laughs> boring. And the rules are really, really complicated. But one of the ways that the rules are complicated is so you can be, a, you can be one of these characters, right? And so every, if you, you can step along. You might have 10 steps in this little world here. And this, this is the only picture I could find on the internet. I don't think anybody's ever finished this game, by the way. It's just a terrible <laughs> game. But you can step through different terrains. And so if you're a man, you, you, you only spend half a point as you move along the roads, right? But if you're an elf, you, can, uh, you, you move through the forests very easily, but it costs you a lot to move through the hills. And if you're a goblin, you can move through the hills very easily, but it costs you a lot to move through the terrain, right? So this is a very nice idea that every, what you might be trying to minimize in general is not just path length or time, but cost, right? So we can actually express this and say navigation is that quite naturally a reward maximization or cost minimization problem. Um, and in fact, we can unify both those ideas with the single, the single number here, the reward, right? So the reward from the current time into the future, and there's lots of ways to characterize this, you know, to, until, until some end state or perhaps with an <coughs> infinite horizon discounting in some way. But either way, you're interested in the total future reward that you're going to get. Um, and rewards can be positive or negative, so they can reflect costs. Um, the reason I bring this up is because this is the central problem motivating a completely different field from the field that we're all in. And that field is known as reinforcement learning. It comes out of psychology and computer science. But increasingly, it's it, pulling in a lot of neuroscientists. So it's a very hot subject now in neuroscience. Um, so I just want to talk about it just a little bit. Um, not least because uh, reinforcement learning probably, well, I mean, who's heard of reinforcement learning, right? Let's see. All right. Now, who thinks that reinforcement learning is probably a really simple and not particularly interesting way to think about learning? Uh, does anybody want to admit that? Um, when I first heard the term reinforcement learning, uh, you know, I was reminded of these theories that of, of basically trial and error learning. So you try a lot of actions, and if you get a reward, then you're gonna, it's more likely you'll, you'll do that action in the future. 
right? And that's, uh, if that's what you're thinking of as reinforcement learning, you, you're not to blame because that's sort of what it was for 100 years. But from about 1970s onwards, uh, the I, reinforcement learning changed. It stopped being a, an algorithm for solving a problem, and it started being a problem. The problem is, when you're navigating around in the world, you don't get a lot of information from the world about what, where you want to be or what actions you should take. You just find food in small, sparse locations. But you have to optimize whole sequences of actions. Uh, and the critical thing is that the people who started working on this, especially in computer science, uh, started to develop the idea of internal representation. So the same way that we're excited about internal representations of vectors and goals and so on, they started developing notions of what internal representations might be. Um, and so they left behind the older ideas that you just needed to have stimulus response learning or just try actions and reward them by immediate outcomes. And they started to develop much more sophisticated notions of what representations need to be learned in the brain to solve these tasks. There's a question. Yeah. Uh, do they, let's say, the organism wants to represent the horizon? I mean, the time horizon is there. I mean, the goal is um, must be completed in time. Yeah, so you, right? you can do it with a finite horizon, or you can have an infinite horizon and discount rewards the further off in the future they are. Sure, you could, essentially, you could have that. If, if each step you're taking is a cost, then the further away the goal is, the higher cost, total cost it's going to have. That's right, so it does give you shortest path-like uh, information, but it can also incorporate this idea that different choices might be more costly than others. So I offer you this uh, very superficial piece of uh, data, but this is sort of proof. that So in the 90s, an awful lot of work was done in computer science on reinforcement learning. Um, but it's astonishing how many of these papers use navigation as the toy problem that they wanted to solve. Actually, not particularly even a toy problem. I mean, some of them are very complicated. But the idea was navigation, the idea of getting from a state or maybe many states, which are locations, to a goal state, was just a very intuitive way to sort of map out many of the problems that they were trying to solve. But, but think about it. So there's an entire field of computer scientists that spent a couple of decades working out solutions to the navigation problem. It turns out that a lot of the solutions they worked out are increasingly being found in the neuroscience literature. We're finding representations in the brain of the things that they predicted. But they didn't care about neuroscience at all. In fact, they barely cared about psychology or behavior. They were approaching this purely as a, a, a computer science problem. And these are four uh, classic papers, actually. Uh, this is certain, for those who care, this is the, from the Diner paper. This is a review by Leslie Kelbling, um, just showing a very complicated, large environment that agents have to navigate through. This was the party game algorithm, where the agent has to figure out what the states are. And this was a, 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 a hierarchical algorithm called Max-Q, which Tom <coughs> Dietrich uh, called the taxi problem, which is having to go to multiple goals in the same environment. But this is just, I've just offered this as sort of proof that navigation is something that a lot of people in RL have been thinking, uh, reinforcement learning have been thinking about for a long time. So just to sharpen our intuitions a little bit, I want to consider a navigation problem of the kind that I'm really promoting here. So not an open area, where, uh, but, but sort of a complicated, uh, it could be a borough, or uh, it could be a building that we're in, or, you know, but it's just some representation of a rather complicated environment. So, Let's think about some strategies for solving this problem. So straight off, we can say that my description of a very simple reinforcement learning algorithm of just rewarding actions that lead immediately to, immediately to reward, that's not going to cut it. Because you're only going to be able to reward actions over here, right? So you don't learn anything about the rest of the environment. Now, a goal vector isn't really going to cut it either, unfortunately. If the animal can smell or see or even remember the direction of the food, that's not really going to help him. Uh, and the reason is because, although there is a relationship, if you add up all of the vector moves that the animal makes, it must sum to this vector. But that's not much of a constraint on his actual action choices, because there are an infinite number of sequences of actions that would obey that constraint, right? Um, so uh, another example would be, if I want to get back to my, I might get this wrong, if I want to get back to my room, my vector is going to be, uh, I guess, 10 meters up there, right? 
But that doesn't tell me anything about what I really need to do, which is I need to m go to the door, take a left turn, go along a corridor, go up some stairs, etc., etc. So the idea is that many navigation problems might involve stringing together arbitrary sequences of actions, a, a sequence of arbitrary actions. But there's another problem I want you to think about, which is, uh, okay, you can solve all of that if you have a map, right? This was actually going back to Tolman, the psychologist Tolman's idea of a cognitive map. So you might have a, what he called a field map, but l literally this, where well, you're looking at it. So this is a map, you've got a map, right? So I just want to show you that this isn't, so what if you're here and you want to get out? Which way am I gonna go, north, south, east, or west? North. 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 Oh, well, you were good. <laughs> but I will avert that you had to kind of, you'd quickly trace that. You knew that this was, you probably had seen this was going to be a dead end. But you had to do a little bit of work to figure out what, what you were actually going to do. Right? So you, there's a search problem. Even if you have a map, you've got to read it. Right? So there are ways, efficient ways to solve this search problem. Uh, and they go back to um, a branch of math called dynamic programming. Um, and this is one such algorithm. It's actually a very efficient algorithm. Uh, if you, you can actually take advantage of what's called a Markov property. So the correct action to take at any given location doesn't depend on how you got there. As long as, once you're there, there is a correct action to take. Right? So that's not always true of any task. Um, for example, an alternation task you do different things in the same location depending on the trial. But in a navigation task like this, where you have to get from somewhere to a goal, you can associate each location with, a, with an action. So the most efficient way to solve this is to just count back the cost. Um, or it, this could be the reward if these were negative values. Count back the cost in steps. Flood that information back through, uh, through the environment. And what that does for you is it makes the navigation problem completely local, right? So here it's trivial. You move to the location that has, takes you one step closer to the goal, by definition, right? So um, the problem, of course, is that you have to, you have to figure this out. You have to, it takes time. So I just want to explain, um, we're almost through with the ideas. I just want to explain these two ideas to you. So the model, having this map I would describe as fast to learn, but slow to use. So imagine the animal just wandering around. All he has to do is poke his nose into places and he can, he can form an understanding of where, of where he is. He can develop this map. The information to put in the map is completely local. Right? But to use the map, as we described, is a search problem, so it's slow. On the other hand, the values take time to distribute throughout the environment. Right? but they're fast to use. Now, why do we care about these two things? Because exploration is expensive. A little critter going around and exploring is uh, opening himself up to uh, predation, right? So you don't want to spend a lot of time. You don't want to repeat experiences just to train yourself on because your brain isn't smart enough to get it in one go, right? But you also don't want to spend a long time making a decision because indecision is also expensive. If you, uh, one idea is that um, all of this is really of greatest value if you're running for your life, right? So the intuition is a little different for something like migration, I imagine. But I in general, if you're running for your life, you want to make that decision of the optimal decision. You want to get to your home as quickly as possible, but you don't want to spend a long time thinking about it. So you'd like to use this system to learn and this system to perform, right? But they're different. So, but they, there is a potential solution. So if you think about it, we're saying both of these behaviors are expensive. So in, if, if that's true, the animals shouldn't be spending that much time doing either of them. And this is not something I've actually quantified, but it's only true in the lab, but I'm not sure how true it is in general. But I imagine that the whole rest of the animal's life can, is probably involved not exploring, not running for its life but resting. So the question is, can you use offline learning to convert a quickly learned model into a quickly available set of actions or values? So that's the key idea 
and the rest of the talk is not going to be about place cells and we'll go back to familiar stuff. But in the back of your mind, I want you to have this notion that the utility of this is, is, is training up, uh, and it could actually be training up systems, um, uh, motor systems or, or value representing systems in the basal ganglia from a model that's been learned in the hippocampus or the cortex. So this is, this is the idea. And you've got tons of time to do that. So, that didn't take too long, that's good. So the data I'm going to talk about is, is, uh, is place cells. Um, the vanilla place cell, right? The dorsal CA1, um, I, w I used to say the right side because that's where everybody's thinking, but now we do bilat bilateral recordings, so that's not true. But the dorsal CA1 pyramidal neuron uh, in the rat hippocampus. So it's in one of the most studied cells, uh, you know, ever. Um, and, but we're interested in what the cells are doing, what they're signaling during free behavior, right? So this is the hippocampus in the rat. Uh, and, and the CA1 area, for those who are not super familiar, it's the output area of the hippocampus. So the, it's, it's the, what, what you see in CA1 is then being sent to uh, the rest of the brain, to cortex and so on. So we are going to do uh, essentially what people have done for decades, which is drop extracellular electrodes, recording electrodes, into this area, nestle close to cells, and try and isolate action potentials from individual cells, but many at the same time. Uh, the trick, which is quite old also, is to use tetrodes. And they are just a, uh, the, the, the notion there is that you have many channels recording from the same population of cells in slightly different spatial positions. So you triangulate the signals, right? The, a cell over here will have a large, every time, there's an action potential, every time there's an action potential, you'll see a large signal on this channel, but a weak one on this, low amplitude on this, rather, I should say, uh, and the converse for a cell over here. So you can actually, if you plot the amplitudes of the different channels against each other, it's really a four-dimensional space, uh, but you'll find that there's clustering. So what we're actually plotting here is, you know, every time you see an extracellular action potential, we can measure the amplitude, right? Of one, and that gives us one number for a channel. We actually have the whole waveform, but just for this, for this purposes, we just say you get one number for each, each time there's a spike on each channel. So four channels, you get four numbers. So you've got this four-dimensional thing. We can plot that <coughs> to save ourselves the mind-blowing difficulty of it. We'll just plot it in two, two of those channels. It's a two-dimensional number, so it's a dot. So every dot here is a spike, right? But they naturally cluster, and the reason they naturally cluster is because they come from physically different uh, uh, sources, right? And you can then laboriously, by hand, figure out which uh, spikes go with which, with which uh, cells or which clusters. So what does this vanilla CA1 place cell do? Uh, you're all fairly familiar, but I'm just going to run through this with you. So this is, this is a track that's about two meters long. And the animal, this is a rat just shuttling up and down. <coughs> and he stops to eat and scratch and sniff and whisk. And then he turns around and runs and stops for a little bit and then turns around and runs. And he just does this over and over. So this is position. This is about 20 minutes of time. And this is him sweeping and stopping for periods of up to a minute and then sweeping across and stopping. And on top of that, you can see the spikes from a from one hippocampal uh, dorsal CA1 cell. So you can see that it's very spatially localized and consistently so across the lamps, okay? Uh, and it's also directional, which is quite common. It's firing in this direction and not in this direction, okay? Um, so that, that's your classic place cell response. And we can capture that, you know, as a uh, basically a histogram normalized by occupancy. That's a one-dimensional place field. And if we've got lots of these cells recorded at the same time, this is what you might typically see. There's 19 cells, um, and well, all, in, all during this behavior. And I think this cell is number four, so this this guy. Uh, but you can see that the cells all seem to have uh, preferences for different locations. So I just want to draw your attention to what I think are the three striking things about place cells. Well, firstly, they're a spatially stable allocentric response, right? They are, that we're clear on that. That by itself is not as remarkable as you might think. I mean, if I uh, bump into some object 
and that object is basically stable. Every time I bump into it, that's, you know, if I have a, if, if, if I have some, uh, you know, pain that's associated with that, that would be a spatially stable signal, right? So the second remark, you see what I'm saying? So the, just having spatial stability, that could be a property of objects in the world. What's more remarkable, in a way, is that they really tile the intervening space. And that's been a theme throughout hippocampal research. You know, people have been trying to find proof that the place cells really cluster around important locations or this or that. But what's remarkable about them is the way they just fire it in the middle of all the important things too. And they just cover this space. Uh, you know, we can talk about why that is. Uh, but that gives the animal essentially spatially stable cues or representations for all these middle parts of the track just as well as at the ends. But I would say the third thing to note is that they're not grid cells. Uh, they're not particularly geometrical in character. They come in all different shapes and sizes. Firing rates can vary wildly. They can have multiple bumps, or some of them you can be unimodal. Um, and they don't, to me, suggest a metric representation of space. I don't see how you, just from the place field structure alone, would decode uh, you know, particular <coughs> quantities, uh, such as distance to an object or something like that. There may be other cells that code those things, but these sort of uh, vanilla place cell responses don't seem to reflect that. And, and the reason I'm saying that is because that's what I'm going to use them for. I'm going to use them as the state representation. I'm going to think about them as a representation of all the places you might perform an action in and want to learn something about that action. I'm not going to, so, so, so we're not going to be using them to define vectors. We're going to be using them to drive this kind of reinforcement learning. So I'll note in passing that there are, from, from the local hippocampal EEG, which reflects the <coughs> activity of thousands of cells, but also uh, you know, dendritic uh, um, synaptic potentials. Um, there are two sort of rhythmic states that are well defined. There's the theta rhythm, or theta rhythm, uh, which is about eight hertz uh, during running. Okay? But as soon as the animal stops, uh, that goes away. And instead you've got this characteristic, uh, what are called sharp waves, uh, uh, sharp waves, which are these, which are called sharp. When you look at them at this, this scale of about a minute, they look like these pointy things. But if you zoom in, you find that they typically have this very high frequency, one to 200 hertz rhythm riding on top of them. It's called a ripple. So the whole thing gets called a sharp wave ripple. Why is this interesting? Because, you know, even before anybody recorded play cells, it was thought likely that this is a time when lots of cells are active in the hippocampus. So the point is, this is where all the placer recordings up until about 10 years ago had ever been taken, uh, most of them. So all the stuff we know about place fields was gathered during this kind of behavior. And not much was known about what was place cells were doing in this behavior. Um, did people find in some other region of the brain uh, this type of um, oscillations from one to still? With the ripple, the sharp wave ripple is, is, is is, is distinct to the, uh, unique to the hippocampus, but there are sort of equivalent differences uh, between sort of active and inactive states throughout the cortex. So you can see, um, um, you can resolve different states of activity that, from EEG that somewhat correspond to this. And, uh, but I'll, I'll get to that later. We know much less about what is going on in the cortex in terms of what I'm about to tell you. Um, so let's follow the activity of those 19 cells zooming in on just one minute in the life of this animal, okay? So now this is positioned on this axis and he's running from one end of the track to the other and then this is a minute, so it takes a few seconds and then he's just stopped up at the end of the track. He's not doing anything, he's just, he's actually doing a few things. He's eating some uh, food, he's whisking, but he's not moving his body anywhere. What do the cells do? So, as the animal runs through the cells, and I put them in order based on where the place fields were, they do this <coughs> classical place field activity of firing in their place fields. This is totally to be expected. Okay. And then when the animal ends up at the end of the track, there are a few cells that represent that location and they fire. But you'll see that there are also these episodes where it looks like all the cells are firing at the same time. And if you just 
Zoom in on that. You see this. Uh, well, let me start at the top here. This is the ripple filtered EEG. So this is a sharp wave ripple event. What you can see is the spikes are firing in a very precise order that somehow <coughs> reflects this order, but it's in reverse. Um, and you see that the cells that represent the current location fire first, but then all the cells fire you know, as if representing a trajectory going back along the track to the beginning. Um, and this, this is actually true for all of these events. So this was lap three, that's this one. And so this is showing you these different events, but everything here is on the same scale. So the 19 cells on the y-axis and 200 or so milliseconds on the x-axis. And you can just see that all of these events just capture this structure. And so we talked about how exp exploration is expensive, right? So this is one lap of running getting turned into 12 what we call reverse replays. And this is just a minute. So if, if those reverse replays are being used to convert this exploration information into uh, a, 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 a propensity to make the correct actions, that would be a very efficient use of the animal's time. Some questions. Uh, isn't it weird that this um, replay is reversed? Because if, I mean, if I imagine that this could be something dealing also maybe as like a pre-play, so planning or, or thinking about those things, and <coughs> because then one might think, okay, this may be also the pre-play for going back, but yeah. when they are going back, those cells actually do not fire in that order because right. of the <coughs> Exactly, exactly. So, so actually the, the, the final, what, what's now clear is that during a stopping period like this, you can have distinctly reverse events of what the animal's just done and forwards events of what he's about to do. So that's very clear, you can have both. Uh, why is reverse replay interesting? So the questions I normally get are, why, do you, why would you have it and how could you get it? Right, how could this be learned? So I'll, maybe we'll get to the how could it be learned later, but why would you have it? I sort of hinted at that already when I described how, um, I can't remember how far back that was, how running information back from the goal is actually the most efficient way to learn value. So we don't have direct evidence that there's a value representation being formed. But if there were, this would be exactly the kind of signal you'd want to see. And this doesn't work if you go forwards. Now, this is trying to just get your intuition, but it's even more powerful in a stochastic environment. Um, it's because of this Markovian property. When you're going backwards, you basically, as when you assign a value to a state, you can put it in the bank. You know that that is the value of that state because it doesn't matter how the animal gets there. You can evaluate it. If you're going forwards, the e value of each state really depends on what you're going to do next, and there's an exponential explosion of possible future action sequences. So a reverse uh, evaluation is actually the most efficient. So I would never have predicted before I saw it that the brain would be using that, but to me it's very striking that that occurs. Sorry, wasn't it also observed in this uh, Schultz experiment in which, I mean, the, the, values, the value of that action was Oh, ah, absolutely. So conditioning. I mean, any, any conditioning or any kind of training, uh, prediction, right, is about sending uh, predictions to earlier and earlier time points. So it doesn't, it's not surprising logically that you want to do that. But I don't think anybody had shown that, um, you know, the, 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 the representation that normally occurs forwards gets replayed backwards. In fact, all of this replay is really unique to the hippocampus at this point. There's hints of it in other places, but this, with this amount of detail, it's, it's really just a technical uh, happenstance that we are able to record these, this number of cells <coughs> in this area. Um, I might talk about that too. But let me talk about how it can be used. And just to, you know, we're talking about building values. This is a very simple model. Um, again, just to show that it's not completely nuts. So if you have some fast onset, slowly decaying reward signal in the brain of some kind, if it is being paired onto some output structure with these reverse replays, then what happens? The, the cells that represent uh, right where you are at the reward 
get paired with, occur at the same time as, and get paired with the highest levels of your reward signal. And less and less and less as you move back along the track. So what you will do is you will learn uh, 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 some kind of value gradient that can then be accessed by the place cells subsequently when running along a track. And just to finish this part, there is this interesting fact that actually when you look at this activity, the classical activity, it turns out it is also sequential. But it's not so sequential that it leaves the place field, right? So uh, place fields are a real thing. Uh, but if you look at the, uh, what the cells are doing, we, we've just expanded the x-axis here and looked at the cells. Again, we can see this because we've got all these cells at the same time. So that helps us see the structure. Uh, but we can see that there is this sort of short look-ahead sequences. Um, and that was brought out more strongly uh, by this uh, paper now 10 years ago, but from David Rich's group, but Adam Johnson, who showed that uh, it's successive moments at a choice point during this theta rhythm, the, the representation of place would sort of push ahead of the animal along one path and then explore the other path as if just tentatively trying the gradient along different uh, uh, possible future paths. So the idea isn't that you want to do what I said was inefficient and explore the entire trajectory, but if you just see in front of you, you might have some gradient information. But this too is just uh, an indirect uh, uh, suggestion that there might be some value readout. That hasn't been shown directly yet. Well, this is a good question. Uh, we don't, um, you get replay of some kind anytime the rat stops. Anytime. Because that's what sharp wave ripples contain. So they don't have to contain replay of the current environment. It's possible that when uh, an animal is, um, you know, trained to perhaps not paying much attention to the current environment, you can see replays <coughs> of other environments. So this is known as remote replay. Um, and it's also true that in these kinds of tasks, when the animal gets very good at it and very bored at, at uh, you know, on the fifth day or something, it doesn't stop very much. So for that rather trivial reason, you don't see replays. But um, they don't look like they just go away. Right? It's, always, it's like a system built to produce these sequences. Uh, but there, are, there is a modulation with reward, which, um, uh, well, I'll just tell you now. So we did these experiments where we changed the amount of reward available at the end of the track. And we found that that actually changed the rate of replay. What was interesting is it changed the rate only of the reverse replays. And the forwards replays didn't change in rate. So I'll get to, I'll, hopefully I'll get to talk about that a little bit. So this basic phenomenon of awake replay, and I should mention, if you've heard the word replay before, you've probably heard it in the context of sleep. It was discovered first during sleep. And the idea is the hippocampus would replay experiences and export them or teach them to the cortex and lay down longer lasting memories in the cortex. That may be true, but it's not really unique to sleep in any way. Uh, replay, as I said, occurs any time a, a rat is pausing and he could be very actively engaged in a task. So he's not sleepy either. Um, so awake replay was then replicated by many labs and as I sort of mentioned, it was shown that you can actually have forwards and reverse replays. Um, in this case, this is upside down from what I showed you, but you see a sort of little burst. This is it expanded, but a little forward burst before the animal runs along the track, and then a reverse uh, event at the end of the track. Um, yes, it's a remote replay. You can sometimes see replay of a different environment altogether. Uh, a very nice study showed looked at a very long track. So, so, so normally, now we use un, you know, uh, neural loggers and things for collecting the data, but we used to be really uh, bound to the, to the tethers that are being plugged into the animal. So normally, the experiments are really, uh, and, and for a reason of attenuation and just ease of use, um, the experiments are always taking place in this sort of two-meter square area. But uh, in Matt Wilson's group, they, 
they cleverly decided to sort of fit this long track into this small area. And what they found was the replays kind of, they chug along at a sort of constant speed, taking up to 700 milliseconds, if necessary, to cover the entire track. I'm desperate to know what happens if you make it this five times longer, you know, because I don't think the animal is going to spend three seconds or five seconds replaying, but I don't know. It's, I wouldn't have expected it to last this long. Um, and the replay field is like that. Any question you have, the chances are we don't know the answer and we're, you know, we'd like to find out. We probably can soon. So another nice experiment was done on this alternation task uh, where in Lauren Frank's group, they actually uh, electrically disrupt, um, you know, they stimulate in a way that disrupts sharp waves in the hippocampus. And they found that specifically here, when the animal has to make a somewhat difficult memory-guided decision, because it's an alternation, there's nothing to tell him what to do, he has to remember what he did last time and do the opposite. Zapping the hippocampus during sharp wave ripples prevented the animal from making the right choices. So just to take stock, uh, place cells, how do we describe what they do? They individuate locations, right? They're not a map, if by a map you mean they're, they supply the brain with a coordinate system auto automatically, or at least we don't have evidence for that. Rather, they provide a set of <coughs> states, they individuate locations that the animal might occupy. And they could support a value function uh, or learning of this, support this kind of reinforcement learning uh, approach. The offline sequences replay past behavior, but actually we'll see it's a bit more complicated than that. But that would make sense in terms of speeding up this kind of value learning. And the online theta sequences may support choices uh, basically by reading out a value function, reading out a local gradient. But there's, I mean, a lot of important questions remain, but one is, what about a real spatial task, right? Um, so these are just linear tracks. The, 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 the trajectory is very well uh, sort of understood. It's not very complicated. Uh, you might wonder whether replay is smart enough or interesting enough to be able to produce interesting trajectories where there isn't that kind of a constraint. So um, my postdoc at the time, Brad Pfeiffer, did this experiment, which is to uh, we tried to develop a real spatial memory task. Um, now, many people have tried to do this, right? I mean, it's a reasonable thing to try and do. Uh, but there's been two problems that have plagued this kind of idea. So people have tried to come up with uh, uh, you know, goal-directed spatial memory tasks. Um, the, the two problems are that behaviorally, so let's say, uh, the, my inspiration was sort of the water maze. So probably everybody knows the water maze task. So in the water maze, you know, the animal is trained to start from unpredictable locations and find his way to a platform, swim to a hidden platform that, you know, he can't see it. He has to remember where it is. So, well, I just ask you, keep you awake. Once the animal, so when the animal starts in the water maze, his, 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 his paths are like this, right? But by the time the animal's learned, you know, on trial 10 or the, the, the day five, right, when the animal's done the regular water maze task, what do his swim paths look like? Very They're very straight. <laughs> so if this was a water maze, it would be like this, right? So we want to know what place cells are doing in this task, but if we did a regular water maze-like task, at the beginning we'd have nice sampling of cells with place fields all over the place, but at the end we'd only have sampling of the small number of place cells along these short paths, which is no good. So we came up with this task, which involves toggling between two different tasks, random foraging and goal-directed navigation. So on odd trials, the animal can wander around, and, and by the way, these, so this is, this is a two meter by two meter environment. These are 36 potential goal locations. There's little, uh, uh, the little like plastic cups and we have uh, tubes attached underneath and liquid chocolate just bubbles up into the cups. Right? And, and they're controlled you know, with syringes, so uh, my, the postdoc is sort of at the end of the room like, squeezing these syringes out. Okay, so very high tech. So the animal doesn't know where the food is on the random trial where the chocolate is, so he wanders around until he finds it. 
Then he can go back. Then the, food, then the chocolate is guaranteed to be here on the even trial, so he can go back. That's a goal-directed trial. Then he has to search again. Then he can go back. Right? So every other trial, we get a goal-directed trial, but we also get sampling of the entire environment. Um, and we know, uh, so they're faster on the goal-directed trials than the, and they take shorter paths on the, fa uh, on the goal-directed trials than on the random trials. And that tells us a bunch of different things, actually, because it tells us that uh, they care about the difference, right? they care about the food because they want to get there more quickly. They can't smell their way to it, otherwise they'd be just as fast going to the random well as they are to the home well. Um, um, and they do remember where the home well is, otherwise they'd be just as slow going to the home well as to the random well. Um, what did we do? We doubled the number of tetras that we were using. So this, um, well, I should have introduced this to say the other problem, let me go back. The other problem is, okay, we've got behavioral sampling of the entire environment, but now we need place fields over the entire environment. So if you remember before, I showed you linear track replay with about 20 place fields, 20 cells arranged along the track. So the back of the envelope calculation, we're going to need something like 20 squared to cover a square a two by two arena. So that's 400 cells. So we didn't get 400 cells, but we were able to get close. So we, um, we have this rather large drive now, this 40 tetra drive, where we're sending two uh, cannulae, uh, we're sending 20 tetras to each hemisphere. Uh, so it really didn't actually change what we were doing because we were implanting 18 tetrodes into one hemisphere before, but it just allowed, you know, by, using, by going bilaterally, and we had to miniaturize the, the weight and everything of these <coughs> various pieces. So we, it's now quite common, but we started 3D printing the drive, so it's out of a lightweight plastic, and we try to make these screws. So you've got to understand what we're doing here. When we implant this thing, um, so firstly, so the animal, these are chips that get plugged in, for behavior, and then the weight is sort of carried a little bit with these tethers. They're suspended, they go straight up, and they take some of the weight off. Uh, otherwise, he's, he just has this part on him, okay? Um, at, the, at surgery, um, there's a craniotomy, but the tetras are above the brain, right? And then slowly, rather painstakingly, for two weeks, we make small, we, eight hours a day, we're making adjustments with these screws and we can, you know, we think we can do tens or 40 microns movements at a time, something like that. Uh, sometimes we talk about eighths of a turn, that's, that comes out to about 40 microns. So we're making these small adjustments over the course of hours, over the course of two weeks, uh, and resolving action potentials and we can see, you know, the goth cortex as we go through it, we can see everything get quieter as we go into the white matter, and we can see the hippocampus and we can resolve um, firstly, the EEG, we see the ripples, and then we can get, get the cells and try and get as many cells as we can on each tetrode, and that's the, that's the game. So this was the payoff. Pay, pay um, on this day, there were 212 simultaneously recorded place cells. So what you're looking at is the, a representation of the two-dimensional place field. So this is the whole environment, two by two, and the firing rate is in yellow. Uh, and firstly, you can see these cells that fire everywhere. They turn out to be inhibitory interneurons. And we can identify them just based on spike waveform. All the rest of the cells, uh, and basically, these are all the cells that had any above some level of activity, right? Um, they have what we would call, regard as place responses. They're, they're spatially localized. But you can see some of them are a little messy. They fire in multiple locations. But many fire in one location. And if we zoom in on some, you know, you can see they're, they're quite large. This is two meters, so these are like half a meter uh, in size, but they vary. Okay, so now, uh, now I'm going to torture you a little bit, torture you a little bit by going through a little bit of math. Um, this is experimental. We'll see how this goes. But before, when I had place fields arranged in a line, I could just arrange them uh, rank them by the peak position, actually, of the field, and I could show that against time, and you could see what was going on. Now we've got this three-dimensional thing, right? We've got two by two positions, and we've got uh, time. So I'm going to show you movies instead. But it's actually, and there's another issue, which is with 200-odd cells, it's no longer the case that uh, 
arranging them in a, uh, by place field peak is that informative. So for example, we also do experiments where we have 200 cells along a linear track. But it looks quite messy uh, because Actual peak position is not the only information that the cell has. Some cells have big place fields, some have small, and their firing during replay captures that dis the place field shapes as well. So what do we do? We do this Bayesian position estimation. And the reason I'm going to talk you through this is because I do want you, because it's actually very simple what we end up with. It's an intuitive, uh, it's very easy to come up with an intuition of what we're actually going to end up with. And I want to also explain, whenever you, for some people at least, whenever you hear the word Bayesian, you immediately think, ah, all right, he's up to something, right? Which would be smart, because that's the point. Um, Bayesian, um, the Bayesian approach allows you to, be, uh, to leverage expectations and leverage information about uh, the, the variable you're trying to predict to make better predictions. That's kind of the whole point, and that's what's exciting about the idea of the brain being Bayesian, the idea of top-down uh, expectations informing your perceptions and so on. Part of what I'm trying to explain here is that we're not really using any of that because we really do just want to come bottom up from the data. But the goal here is to estimate the represented position of the animal. I'm fudging that, right, because I don't really care about the position of the animal. I've got a camera, so I know where the animal is. I want to know what does the, what does the hippocampus think? Where does the hippocampus think the animal is, right? And we're just going to use two things. I'm going to use the spike counts. So imagine we have a a time bin of like 20 milliseconds. So within that 20 milliseconds, we've got a spike count for all of the cells. So let's say we have 100 cells. Most of the cells will not fire a spike. Some will fire one spike. A very small number might fire two spikes, right? Within this very short time bin. And then we've got the place fields. And that's it. And from that, we want to end up with this posterior probability. Basically, for every position, we want to know what, what's, how probable is it the hippocampus say the animal is there. And so Bayes tells us there's a relationship between this guy, which is what we're interested in, which is the posterior probability of position, given the spike, uh, the spike counts, there's a relation between that and the inverse, which is basically the place field, right? We know the probability of getting spikes for each cell based on, based on where, this animal, where the animal is. That's the place field. So I'm going to go through this too quickly for some and too slowly for some. Uh, but we'll see how we go. So the first thing is, but people never do this. People never really explain everything. So let's see. So this guy is just a normalization factor. And this is the same thing. This is this. It's just, this is a probability. So across all positions, it has to sum to 1. Okay? So when we calculate this thing, we then divide by the sum across all the positions. That ju that's just a normalizing factor. So you can, we don't care about that. So the other thing is, this term over here, let me go back, is called the prior. Right? That's the clever part. That's the part where Bayes, Bayesian uh, inference really comes into its own. You leverage your prior expectation. We're not going to use that. We're going to have a uniform prior that then cancels out. So that's, that's really not happening in this equation. So you can ignore it. So really, we end up <coughs> with this term. So let's talk what the, about what that is. So this is the probability. It's the inverse of what we care about, right? It's the probability of getting that particular set of spikes, spike counts, if the animal is in a given position. So it's the probability of all of the spike counts across all the cells. So I'm going to try and ask you a question. Uh, what can we say if the only thing governing the spiking of a cell is its place field? What is the dependence on what other cells are doing? No, somebody said the answer. It's independent. It's independent, right. It's the only thing governing the spike. So the model we're using here, which we will then see is violated, but the model we're using, the generative model, the, the sort of um, simple model we're starting out from, is that the only thing that governs the spiking of the cells is, its pla is the place field. So that's independent of all the other cells. So in calculating this probability, we can assume that, uh, that we can treat each cell independently. And then if the only thing we know about the cell is the firing rate, is the, is, the, is the place field, which is a firing rate in each position, what, and, and the firing rates are pretty low, right, in one or two spikes, what, what distribution are we going to use to calculate this thing? You know, single parameter distribution. Poisson. Poisson, right. So, 
that's the Poisson distribution. What is this saying? It's saying that this is the probability of a particular number of spikes for cell i, uh, given by this function, function of its place field, this is its firing rate in this position, right? And then we can multiply them all together because they're independent. So I'm going to keep going because we can make this much simpler. This guy is the spike counts, right? The factorial of the spike counts, and then it can come out and get multiplied. The point is, this is going to, is independent of position, right? So you're going to have the same term on the top and on the bottom. So we can just get rid of it, OK? One less thing to worry about. Now what about this guy? This is actually a quite an important term because it tells you what's happening when there are no spikes. But it doesn't depend on the spike count. So we're going to give it a little pink cross, which means for the sake of this intuition that I'm trying to give you, we're going, we can ignore that too. So we end up with this notion, in fact, this thing that we care about, essentially, except for a normalization factor, is related to this. Now, what's this? Imagine the spike counts in this very small time bin are basically zero or one. There might be a few double spikes, but they're basically a cell within 20 milliseconds is going to spike or it doesn't spike. Okay. So what's the interpretation of this quantity? Anybody want to hazard a sort of intuitive guess? I mean, this is a one or a zero, and this is the product. So basically what we're imagining, well, I'll just show you, is that if a cell fires a spike, then it's basically uh, its whole place field is going to take into account. It's, it, the, the, the posterior probability is going to look like its place field. If several cells fire a spike, you actually are going to take the product, just the position by position, the product of those place fields. This is actually not quite right, because this is this transparency function in PowerPoint, and this is probably a sum. But imagine the much more extreme multiplication of these fields. And you'll see that this little location here is going to be really strongly brought out. Right? If these were the place fields of four cells, they'll be put off by how round they are. Just If these are the place fields of four imaginary cells, and they each fire one spike, then my posterior is going to be very strongly just representing this overlap. Yeah. The cool part about this is that this might happen. right? It's entirely possible that these four cells could each fire a spike, in which case my posterior is going to be over here, even though the rat's over here. Okay? And another possibility is something like this, in which case disparate cells each fire a spike and I'm not going to have any overlap. Right? So the posterior is going to be flat. So with this in mind, I'm going to show you the kind of movie we can generate. In this case, there's those 212 place cells, and this is real time while the animal's running. So you can see what's going on. So <laughs> what you're looking at is the 2 meter by 2 meter arena, the 36 goal locations, this is the home well. This is actually green because it's the baited well in this particular, at this particular moment. The rat doesn't know it because it's the randomly baited one. What you can see is a depiction of the rat's position and heading. And then the flickering is uh, a representation of the posterior probability. And so every pixel has a number. That's just Most of them are very small, so they're black. It's on this heat, heat scale. But you can see a concentration very close to the animal. So I'm going to play that one more time. And you can see that, remember, the place fields are quite big. But because of this property of picking up the overlap, we can see that the, the actual representation is very, very tightly close to where the animal is at all times. Uh, perhaps looks like it's jumping ahead, doesn't it? But nevertheless, it seems to follow around. So what's going to happen next is he's going to be there, and then I'm going to show you another movie, which is what happened next. Uh, but this is a little different, because this is now going to be um, uh, one or two, I can't remember, uh, actually four, I think, sharp wave ripple events in succession. And 
we're going to play them. The movie's now going to go much more slowly, meaning that was real time, what you saw. But now, if you remember, replay events move around, you know, take 100 milliseconds or so to cross a track. So now we're going to play this thing 20 times uh, more slowly. Uh, and that means we have less data going into each frame, right? So it's going to look a little noisier, right? But this is what happens next, right? The representation of position moves smoothly away from the animal's current position and towards the remembered goal. And, and these are four different events that occurred. Uh, so it's the same thing that's gone into it. We just, um, actually in that discussion of the equation, I didn't put the time constant, but that's not. Uh, but it's the same, uh, it's the same uh, process that was used to estimate position during running. But now you can see it's, the, it, it's showing this effect, which is really the generalization into two dimensions of what replay is, right? There are trajectories. Um, so uh, each event is very sparse at each moment in time. And we can, it's so sparse that we can actually collapse time and produce these representations of trajectories. And so you can see that uh, the trajectories, the, the blue arrows are where the animal was. The animal's quite still when these are happening. They're taking just a few, one or 200 milliseconds, and they're moving usually away from the current position and very often towards the home well position, the remembered goal position. And this can be quantified in a variety of different ways. I don't want to spend too much time on it, uh, but uh, one way we quantified it was to say, well, what, what happens to all the events that happen when the animal's at the home well? So they have an initiation bias. They start at the home well. So if we just take these kinds of representations and layer them on top of each other, we find that the home well is strongly overrepresented. But if we take all of the events that happen when the animal's at the random well and is about to go home, they also have this particular location overrepresented. That's because they're all headed towards the home well. Not, not all of them, but many of them. And this can be quantified here, where the amount of representation, which is sort of the, once we've done this layering, you know, the, the amount of uh, <coughs> probability, um, some probability mass in each of these, uh, near each of the goal locations, it strongly picks out where the home location is. So the home location is actually an outlier. So I like this result because although there's some heterogeneity, right, as an experimenter, we can look at this data and I can tell you where the animal's remembered goal location is. And that's not something we've been able to decode from play cells before. So this says that now, you know, you can just see from the offline activity of the play cells where the remembered goal, goal was. So you can get new sequences in this. Do you, is it at all possible to form new play cells? Or like, you know, play cells you haven't visited that are ob like obvious places that would lie on the path. I think in open maces it's a little difficult. You could imagine situations where you know a day is early, but you never walk there because it wasn't known. Oh, right. So, um, so actually, um, yeah, I have. Uh, I'll try to give a short answer to that question. Um, I think there are two kinds of shortcutting. So we, we haven't not looked at that. Uh, to me, there are two kinds of shortcutting. Uh, one is what you do across this space that you've never been to before. And the other is what you do with a space that you have been through before, but which needs to be interpreted in a new way. And uh, that might not make much sense, but I see the former as a bit of a reduced kind of question, because essentially that is a vector, right? If, you, if you're somewhere and you know you want to be somewhere else and you have no information about what that intervening space is, it's, there's a limit to how smart you can be. And what if it's not an open, uh, field, well, if it's a minefield, right? I mean, you, not knowing anything about space is not that great a position to be in and is not going to elicit the most intelligent behaviors. It can't. Whereas more interesting kinds of shortcutting are where you know an environment, but now somebody changes something. They block off a door or, or an animal discovers a path uh, through a river that was uh, previously too flooded or a tree falls down, and then it has to do something smart and not learn all over from scratch. So to me, that's the more interesting kind of shortcutting, but it is much less explored, I would say, in the, in the literature. Uh, so I'm going to move along and to point out one other sort of 
key aspect of this task. We actually moved the location of the home mail every day. So the animal had to learn a new one. And this has, the, 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 we did this deliberately to kind of keep the hippocampus uh, interested. It looked like that would be more of a, uh, make it more of a hippocampal task, although that has not been shown by us whether or not it is actually hippocampally dependent. Um, but we moved the goal, and so this gives you an example of what happens when you move the goal. The random well, so, so goal directed navigation is happening from these random wells, right? The random wells don't repeat, at least for the first 19 trials of each day. So that's most of the trials. So the random wells don't repeat, right? And they're not predictable. <coughs> so that means that every path that the animal has to take is actually a novel combination of start and end point. So it's a very familiar space, but he has to put together essentially a new path that he's not, uh, he's, he's probably taken, run through that space, probably that exact path many times, but he's never done it in the context of being here and needing to get there, right? And the point, the reason I'm telling you all that is that if you look at this movie that is sort of composite of the two different timescales, behavioral timescale and replay timescale, you can see that that situation doesn't phase the hippocampus at all. So here's the activity following the animal around, and then we'll go into these, he finds the random well, and then we'll see these sharp waves. And so here's an event that goes straight st and actually hovers at the, uh, at the goal, the remembered goal. And this one actually goes down here, but that's actually interesting. We can, we'll see that in a minute. Another quick one there, and that's a path that he, so again, he hasn't started there and had to go there before, and then he does it. So he's perfectly, uh, what's the significance of that? I don't know, but maybe replay's involved in planning that uh, action. Now, he continues to be interested in here, and in fact, it, he does actually go there. Um, so, I have a six minute video, which is just a continuous 20 minutes of behavior and in this task. So, if, we, if I finish, I might show that to you. I love watching it. Uh, otherwise, maybe I can show it to anybody who's interested afterwards. Uh, but you can just see, then you can get the rhythm of the task and you can just see how this is a continual thing that's happening. So let me summarize this part. Place cell sequences in a spatial task tend to, and I didn't elaborate all of this just for the sake of time, but they tend to start in the current location, uh, end at the goal, and predict the path the animal's about to take. And this is true even for the many trials in which there's a novel and unpredictable combination, combination of start and end location. So first you were telling us that the replay is inverted, and now it yeah, excellent. jumps ahead. Yeah, so both occur. In the open field, it's hard to tell what the direction is because the, uh, at least the thought is that the place cells are less, uh, uh, they are less directionally tuned. They're not uh, omnidirectional, they're not perfectly uh, radially symmetric, but um, it's also true that it's hard to get that directional information because the, the animal doesn't sample all movement directions in all locations. So there's actually a, a significant problem trying to get uh, directional data so that you can, we can say this is a reverse sequence, this is a forward sequence. That may not even make any sense. Uh, but in general, you get both. So I think there's a number of hedging things I can say. Firstly, uh, we, we decided that it's possible that reverse and forwards replay might have different functions. Reverse replay, learning, driving this kind of the learning of values, but forwards replay may be um, uh, an elaboration of this retrieval of values. So normally you might just be looking ahead of you, but maybe there are instances where the animal generates a, a, a longer uh, representation of an action sequence that is really a sort of, it's, his, it's the animal's way of reducing the dimensionality of the task. So in reinforcement learning, this is sometimes called options, but you have these sequen uh, action sequences that the animal can then use as a, uh, as a choice. I'm going to follow this path to its, uh, this particular sequence to its end, and that reduces the dimensionality, dimensionality of the learning task. So actually, all of that might be wrong. There's a very nice new RL theory by, um, uh, it's just been on the archives now, by Nathaniel Dorr uh, and um, someone working with him, I forget his name, sorry, uh, where he has a unifying account of forwards and reverse replay. It's very nice. It describes how you can actually predict under which circumstances you need to do reverse backups and forwards backups of the value function. And so he unifies the whole thing in terms of value learning. So it is, you, it's possible to explain why under some circumstances you need forwards uh, sequences. So what I'm going to do in the remaining time is just run through a few 
kind of one slide each results that we have done more recently. Um, and we'll see how that goes. So one of the results we published, this is the only, oh, maybe there are two slides. Uh, we needed to know whether this, this kind of sequenced activity is learned or not. Um, this sort of goes back to the idea that in the hippocampus you have remapping. So every different environment, a different group of 30 to 50% of cells is recruited and they fire in different places. Okay? So uh, if you are going to have pre-existing sequences, the place has enormous constraints, um, probably on the number of environments you can encode, but also on the kinds of sequences you can form. Right? So uh, there was a result uh, published claiming that there was, there was evidence for sequences, sounds strange to say, but before experience, as if reflecting some uh, internal organization, uh, sequential organization of the cells that then gets recruited to a particular environment. But uh, to cut a long story short, we, we investigate this in several different ways and we show, show no evidence for this. So this is a sleep period just prior to an experience on a track, on a novel track, and these are, you know, out of the hundreds of events, these are the best correlated ordered events that we could find, and these are the same best events you can find during the first few laps on a novel track. And you can see they're absolutely completely different. So essentially, uh, without belaboring it, looking at this in many different ways, we just find no evidence for structure. We also find evidence for um, some of the molecular mechanisms of learning. So there's this uh, NMDA receptor mechanism that's been very uh, influential, uh, think about in terms of uh, um, supporting learning. Um, um, I won't spend too much time in this, but it, 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 what's interesting about this is that when you uh, block NMDA receptors, either uh, with some kind of genetic knockout or with a pharmacological uh, intervention, place field responses aren't that different. Um, which seems a little <coughs> odd, but it goes back to the idea that um, place fields are not this very, not necessarily an exquisite, geometrical, difficult to sort of very finely tuned thing. They're really just a, 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 a they're somewhere where probably a, a whole range of inputs happens to pop above inhibition and you get a, spa, a sparse representation. And so you can still get them driven by whatever's driving the activity of the hippocampal cells without, with these learning mechanisms blocked, but you don't get any awake replay sequences. Is dopamine somehow involved in this generation? Or? Ah, well, so actually, I'll get to that. Uh, we don't know much about it, but we had some hints about it because well, we... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, that's not known. The, the interaction between sort of blocking uh, dopamine antagonism, let's say, in the hippocampus, we're very interested in it. Uh, but we don't know the answer yet. Um, but we have the reward experiment to sort of provide a hint of something. So I'll get to that in two slides. Um, so we think the sequences are learned. So we think that this is a representation that, that the place field responses are somehow driven by sensory input or other kinds of inputs, uh, maybe whatever it is, but um, they can be rapidly stitched together. So then the question is how rapidly? And so it's quite striking that um, this is going back to the original reverse replay experiment, but you clearly get many events even on the f after the first lap. The animal just, he's never been on this track before and he runs down and during that, you know, it's three seconds of experience. And then in this minute or so, you get these events. So, I mean, this is really, uh, to me, this is very interesting. I mean, uh, you know, you want to think of all the different kinds of simpler mechanism that could do this. Is this some kind of activity trace or so on? Um, you can't rule anything out, but given the dependence on NBA receptors, if we did this with the NBA receptors blocked, you wouldn't see any of this activity, even though the place cells would have been firing. So we think this may be learned, uh, and in which case it's learned very rapidly. Now we did this, was there a question? Somebody had a question. Selectively reverse versus forwards, or just replay at all? 
So the, the question was, uh, can we block replays and see an effect on, for example, memory consolidation? Was that yeah, a question? Like, um, basically, you need to continuously do these replays to be able to like, store memories about the lab. Or mm -hmm. would it be sufficient? So can, they, can they learn something just so doing the, the walking? Where they yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually, th we don't know. We don't know because they happen so rapidly. They happen just when the animal pauses. There is a very interesting result that may or may not be related in fear conditioning. I don't know. This is probably not something that people are familiar with. But uh, you know, rats and mice can form very strong, long-lasting memories uh, of fear of a small environment if they're given a little electric shock in it, not surprisingly. But if they haven't been in that environment for something like 30 seconds, before they receive a shock, they don't form any memory at all. So there's something, um, at least for the rat and the mice, about consolidating this environment. And, these, and you know, these are lab, you know, cage-housed animals. Maybe it's really shocking. You know, it's very surprising to them. They don't know what to make of this environment. But they need a minute or so. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I've often wondered whether, you know, that's the kind of experiment that might show that ripples are really necessary or not. But we don't, we don't know. Uh, and, and the point is, you get. You actually get this replay activity all the time. And so it's very hard to find situations where, where it hasn't happened. Um, here, just in one slide, is a, just to show an experiment we did changing the reward. So three different epochs. So it's, there's only one track, but experienced 10 laps, and then you wait, and then 10 more laps, and then wait, and 10 more laps. And, but in the middle epoch, we changed the amount of uh, chocolate at one end of the track. and it actually led to an increase in the rate of reverse replay. So not just the number, but the, the rate per second. But only for reverse replays and not for forwards replays. And the results were less clear when we tried to do the corresponding decrease. But there was, again, only a significant effect in the reverse, on reverse replays. As if it's reverse replay that, for some reason, is particularly sensitive to reward manipulations. Um, and forwards replay, if it would, would make sense. Because if your forwards replay, it, even just without too much theoretical baggage. If forwards replay is about something out there, right? Reverse replay is about here and what you did to get to here. So it makes sense that the changes to the, va the reward of here would have an impact on that. Forwards replay may be about accessing information about things that you can get to. And so knowing something about where, you know, changing the uh, evaluation of your current location isn't that important in terms of this far away, distant goal that you're trying to get to. So that's the best we can make of it. Um, now, <coughs> one of the things we were able to do in follow-up, um, maybe counterintuitively, was go back to the linear track, so the boring old linear track, right? Um, but now we had, you know, 200 and something cells. So really got very heavy coverage of place fields along this linear track. And to our surprise, that actually led to the finding that the replays turned out to be somewhat lumpy. You know, they don't move smoothly. You know, as we add more and more data, more and more coverage, and now every single part of the track has 10 or 20 place fields associated with it, we actually find that the replay has this tendency to hover in one location for, you know, 10 or 20 milliseconds and then dissolve and move, jump to another location, and dissolve and jump to another location. So we think, and this is somewhat weakly, uh, very weakly, but weakly locked to slow gamma, which has been sort of described as uh, uh, pacing these, uh, uh, the, 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 the ripples within the, the uh, sharp wave ripple events. But this shows that actually the information content has this. So wh what do we make of this? Um, so the uh, late John Lisman had a theory uh, of why you would want to do something like this. So the idea is that, uh, you know, the original Hotfield net, which is, you know, an auto-associative net where you try and store patterns, and people had said that CA3 might be such a network, right, for storing memories. It's not very good if you try and store heterosociative associations. If you try and get one pattern A to lead to the retrieval of a pattern B to lead that will lead to retrieval of pattern C. It just doesn't work very well. In fact, the original 1982 Hotfield paper on the Hotfield net, he actually says that. He tried to train these sequences, it doesn't work. And the idea is just sort of intuitive, it's that you get this massive accumulation of error. The whole idea of the Hotfield network is that 
Uh, these recurrent synapses will slow, were guaranteed to relax you into an attractor, uh, you, which you could also think of as pattern completion. You, you, you start off with a, a slightly botched version of your memory and you fall into the, uh, the completed, perfected memory that it corresponds to, right? But you can't do that. That breaks down if you're not trying to auto-associate, but you're trying to recover some other pattern. So the solution was actually proposed uh, by several people, uh, theoreticians in the 80s, but Lisman picked up on this, was to combine auto-association with heterosociation. So you need fast synapses to basically error-correct individual patterns, and then you need slower synapses to lead to the recovery of the next pattern along. And the idea is that whenever you get the next pattern along, you always get a little bit of error, but if you've got this fast auto-association, you could be relaxing into the, the retrieved pattern, and then you were, and, and, and it's, it is, it's just a simulated and f fact that this will store sequences very, very well. So that led us to think, well, maybe then fast and slow synapses might actually correspond to different, well, actually, this is a Lisman's idea too, uh, will correspond to different circuit uh, elements and numbers of synapses, right? So uh, maybe CA3 is storing these individual locations as kind of these snapshot memories, but then the wider loop, and there are many candidate loops that could be occurring here. I haven't shown all of the anatomical loops that are possible, but a wider loop might, might actually allow this to move along from one location to the next. Um, and the, the, the key idea here is that although 100 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds is very fast, um, much too fast to see anything with a calcium indicator in an optical imaging experiment, it's actually really, really a huge amount of time from the point of view of uh, you know, synaptic integration times and spike, uh, uh, synaptic transmission in a circuit like this. So you could have several loops uh, around a, a, a quite complex circuitry within that 100 or 200 milliseconds. So um, you know, we have a tendency to try and think of all of these things as being one circuit alone. Uh, which is probably a good place to start, but there's no reason for that to be true. So a little bit more evidence for that is if we go back to this original reverse replay experiment and we look at all the events that happen after each, in each stopping period, there's this actual remarkable change. <coughs> well, actually, let me stop. Let's do this as a question. So you might have seen it already. But so these sequences... As the animal has more and more experience, uh, you might expect that the underlying uh, network is getting stronger, there's some kind of potentiation, uh, you're building up, you're strengthening the connections between neurons, and you certainly do recruit more spikes. So more cells are involved in replays on lap 13 than lap 1, and, more, and each cell is spiking more. So what do you expect will happen to the replays in, those, in that circumstances? Are they going to get faster? Are they going to get slower? Are they going to stay the same or what? Anybody want to hazard a guess? This is with more, um, more experience. Yeah, so let's say you, I mean, you, whatever your favorite network would, would be for forming sequences, you've strengthened the connections between cells. It, it seems like, it, it seems to me that these replays are somewhat indicative of motivation state. Well, that, that could be true. Yeah, it seems like, so, in the, looking at it in the ecology of the animal, the animal leaves its home and it finds, it, like, your rewards, it gets a better reward. It might have an increased replay rate because now it's, it's got a better motivation to go back. It hoards something and wants to go back to its nest. Yeah. Something along that line. So yeah, it, right. Well, there's two, there's, so there's two different things I want to distinguish. There's replay rate, which I've described as the number of replays you get per second, which is like the number of sharp wave ripples you get, right? So that's, but now we're talking about the duration of individual replays. But I get your point. Maybe when the animal's highly motivated, they're fast because it doesn't want to wait around to get the answer. It could be that. Uh, but if you were to, I think it's certainly true that if you have a, um, uh, you know, a symphire chain or something like that to produce sequences, then as you increase the weights, the, the, sequence, the synaptic integration is faster and the thing just gets faster. And so this is a prediction that's been made by <coughs> actually Bruce McNaughton that uh, you should see as the, as the memory gets stronger, things get faster. Yeah. So our point is uh, that... Uh, yeah. I, I guess, would you see it get slower if they get more 
familiar and comfortable in your life. Yeah, so that's your suggestion. It's a good one because it fits the data. I don't know if it's true or not. But you can see, and it's one of the most robust effects actually across all of our data sets. Every single animal we've recorded, you always see this. The replays get slower. And it's very strange actually. But, um, so, for the, how are we doing on time? What, I, what I'm going to suggest is that in terms of mechanism. It started late. It started late, okay. Get another few minutes, yeah. So, I'm going to suggest that, uh, that our more, what we think is a slightly more sophisticated way of how replay sequences can be produced by this more complicated circuit can actually account for this. But I did just want to stop and actually note that from the point of view of value learning, so this isn't really a motivational explanation, but from the point of view of value learning, there, and I'm sorry, I just took this figure and blew these things up, so this is why they look so horrible. But this is a rapid <coughs> lap one replay, and this is the slower uh, lap 13 replay, and this is the same amount of time. Now, we know that in terms of driving learning, that you know, there are certain time constants for plasticity and so on. So, likely, there are sort of certain time windows under which important things happen. So, this would suggest that uh, early on, you're really learning information about the whole of the track, and you're comparing places all along the track. And here, you're just comparing neighboring places. It turns out that there's a very well-established notion of why you'd want to do this in terms of value learning, which is that um, in the beginning, when you're learning an envi environment, you know nothing about anything, right? You don't know anything about the whole environment. So any information you can get out, no matter how noisy, and, and your paths to the goal might be very, very noisy, but it's better than nothing. So you're willing to take the whole path and turn that into values. But as you get more and more experience. Now, you don't trust necessarily these long, windy paths to be informative, but you, you expect just smaller scale comparisons between neighboring locations to be more informative. And we call that uh, uh, a, a, an effort to reduce variance later on, uh, whereas you're reducing bias earlier on. So that would actually nicely correspond to this difference. If a downstream system is doing value learning just on whatever uh, cells are being active within some kind of fixed window. Oh. Um, so in the longer uh, replay, do you find that the behavior is just more of a straight line? The behavior is more of a straight line. Ah, well, this is all on the linear track. So, so um, these kinds of comparisons are very much harder to make on an open field, although you do see exactly the same thing. You see on the early trials, the, the replays sort of zip along. So you see exactly this, but we haven't analyzed it in that way. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. There are no pre existing uh, networks. How do you explain the novel tracks in the 2D experiment in the Like, right, right, right. Say that the, yeah. you have the reverse replay of the yeah. same track? No, no, no. So, so, I should, so there's two, there's a number of different things going on. But I think the, uh, so if we go back to this model, but these, these transitions are not capturing um, you know, transitions that have been made by the animal necessarily and experienced you know, tens or 20 times. They are the transitions that can produce these novel combinations of sequences. So there's something, uh, if I had to just put it into words, I would say the hippocampus captures, re replay captures something like the adjacency of locations. But given that local information, the local model, it can actually generate, uh, put together pieces of the environment in novel combinations. Um, not not uh, in general illogical combinations, just, uh, you know, if, 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 if an environment has been experienced, half of the environment is experienced on one occasion and the other, half, oops, the other half on a different occasion, replay can put those two experiences together. <coughs> well, if, 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 the, if, if somehow the, what's being captured is the, uh, the local aspect of the model, the um, state transitions just on neighboring locations, that should be enough. Basically, that's, your, that's your, your local model that I showed being built up. But then you can sample from it with longer scale. You, know, you, you can basically follow that model. It's like a little... Uh, 
uh, uh, state uh, generation machine. You can use that to make predictions uh, and to generate uh, simulated sequences. And those simulated sequences can be different from any particular sequence that you've experienced. Um, I mean, uh, so, you know, if you've, if you've done this, and then on a different occasion you've done that, then replay can do this, you can do that, you know. It doesn't tend to do that, but it will do all of the above. So I don't think, been, I don't think it's impossible to imagine how it would do it, uh, but that's, that's a very characteristic feature um, of replay. So um, I just had a few slides just to indicate the kinds of things we're doing um, sort of in the future. Um, so if this is very, very, very briefly, I won't go into any details. We're interested in trying to get at now the circuit by, you know, trying to switch different bits of the circuit on and off. And uh, this, um, you know, so we started to get interested in, in it really the most obvious candidate was CA3. And can we shut down CA3 and see what effect it has? And we do these optogenetic experiments and this sort of drive which combines both uh, optical fibers and uh, tetrodes. And, uh, you know, we, when we shine the light, we can completely get rid of ripples. That's, uh, and, and, you know, there's more, more there about place field responses. We're also interested in uh, more complicated environments with barrier structure. So, you know, this spatial task was still pretty trivial in terms of just, you know, go straight to the goal. So after everything I said about vectors, and I came up with this task where the animal can go straight to the goal, right? So nobody pounced on me for that, but you should have. On the other hand, you have the place fields, right? So we know that it's still stringing together place fields somehow, right? But the question is, what can you do if you have real barrier structure? Uh, I don't have too much to say about that yet, but I have a postdoc who's very interested in this. And, uh, you know, at the moment, it, the replay really respects the barriers and seems to be able to do the same sort of thing in this more complicated environment. Uh, we're very interested in trying to online detect the content of replay so that we can start to make causal manipulations contingent not just on sharp waves occurring, but on the replay content. So we'd like, so in this case, it's a pretty complicated thing to do. So uh, because what I didn't tell you, uh, uh, I'm trying not to mention if I'm trying to recruit people to the lab, but uh, uh, you know, when you end up with this from your data, it takes you, you know, maybe a couple of months to get to that. So um, at least across all of your cells, right? So it's one of those things, it's like sort of tracing, uh, EM or something else. It's just, it's not very well automated right now. Uh, and so people doing it by hand laboriously, it's still the state of the art. However, it turns out that if you don't care so much about being really, really clear, really, really satisfied that you've isolated cells, but you really just want to project this thing into this position space and do this decoding, you can do a bit of a half-assed version of the clustering and get Decoding, which is just as good as what you get after two months of working at this thing by hand. So you can write computers. This is actually a computer, you know, it's a very simple algorithm for just uh, clustering this data. And it can do it on the data collected in, you know, a 20 minute session. So we can get clustering. And then we can use it on the second half of the session to drive online replay detection. And so this is uh, a V shaped track. And we see these position extending on one or other arm of this V. And the animal's in the middle, and it generates these two replays, one after the other. And we were able to, you can't really see it, we were able to deliver uh, some electrical stimulation contingent on this. So actually, this stimulation we're now is, uh, we were trying to be clever. So this is medial forebrain bundle stimulation. We're trying to associate an outcome in the most sort of quick and dirty way we can with this replay and not with this. So that's very much ongoing. But you know, further down the line, we want to actually do things optogenetically and get control of specific reward systems, value systems, and so on. There's one more thing I wanted to say. I don't know if Edward's here, but it's something he mentioned. Um, so uh, there's lots to try and understand here, but there's one, there's one problem with implicit in what I've told you. Uh, it's not insurmountable, but it's kind of interesting. Which is So this is a model. So I've been thinking about this kind of thing for a long time before I did any experiments. <laughs> And I'd done a model of how place cells might be used in reinforcement learning, not with any replay, but just sort of online, and what you would now call model-free learning. 
And the idea, but it's the same idea basically as I've been telling you, which is if you've got a bunch of place cells, you can, because of this Markovian property, you can associate with them things like particular actions. So this is like saying you have a, an action associated with every location in the environment, in this water maze, uh, or a value. So you can have some function over space, uh, we call it the critic, but basically a, th this estimate of how far away you are from the goal, or, which, or the, some total expected future reward, right? So you, this is the whole idea. And this is when I start drawing uh, these mazes with numbers on them, the idea is I'm associating various quantities with positions. And I've got place cells, right? So I should be fine. Well, it's not fine because um, remapping. You know that actually when we sampled 200 place cells, well, there were um, you know, probably 100,000 place cells that were active in CA1, of which I sampled 200. And in any given location, there are going to be five or 10,000 cells that fire. But this, another way of putting it is, this cell will fire in another 1,000 different uh, environments. And a rat, you know, a rat's navigational territory is, you know, much bigger than a, we've talked about this uh, in some discussions, but, you know, rats can cover, you know, half a mile, square, half square mile of, square half mile, whatever. Uh, of territory, uh, it's nothing like an environmental lab, okay? So, so, so think about it. So if you're doing this, this is the, this is the XOR problem, right? If, if we have to associate this place cell with a weight to this critic, well, in one environment, it might be right next to the goal. In another environment, it might be right at the other end, far away from the goal. And in the other environments, it might be in the middle. So once you've trained this thing on all the environments, this thing's just going to be smushed out some neutral value. There's going to be no information at all. So it's actually quite unlikely that place cells will project directly to the representations of value. There's, a, there's this XOR problem. So what is, what's, the solution? what's the solution to that? These, well, this is a, these are perceptrons trying to solve this problem. So how do we solve, how do, how do AI people solve that problem? Yeah, or another 10 layers, right, exactly. So that's, um, you know, if I had a penny for the number of times I've been asked, you know, how do, you know, are there monosynaptic connections between CA1 place cells and your value representation, and ventral striatum, and if, if there aren't, there are, but not so many, then that means this whole thing's wrong. What's well, the other way around, actually? Because you want many, many processing stages to be able to convert this representation into these representations. So this is a deep learning problem. Um, so that's something we're sort of interested in, too. So, um, place cells provide a very particular representation for navigation, I would argue, which is, seems less informative about geometrical quantities like vectors, but more useful as a substrate for something like value learning, or <coughs> policy learning, or these kinds of RL uh, representations. If that's true, then replay can be understood as a powerful mechanism for promoting this kind of value learning, and so promoting navigation, navigational learning and planning. And then I, I really want to leave you with this somewhat tangential thought. Um, the hippocampus is accidentally the only place that anybody's really recorded 200 cells with millisecond, sub-millisecond re temporal resolution and where we had a fairly good idea of what made those individual cells fire, right? That combination of things is very powerful, but it's there's a temptation to say, well, replay is a hippocampal thing. It's for replaying memories. It's for consolidating memory. Or a bunch of replay sp uh, hippocampal specific functions. But I think it's just as likely or more likely that every area, certainly of the cortex, uh, uh, and I better say something about uh, invertebrates. I can't think of but uh, many areas of the many different kinds of brains may have may be showing this kind of activity. In which case, we barely understand what's going on, right? We've just scratched, we just, we've got these correlates of activity that, you know, a place field will fire during the second that an animal runs through it. But within that second, there's all this structure at the level of milliseconds and tens of milliseconds that we're missing. So if that's also true in, you know, the visual part of the brain or, or the other uh, whatever, all over the brain, uh, mammalian brain and possibly uh, other brains too, then, then we've still got a, a lot that we need to study. 
So uh, I will end by thanking, well, you've heard a lot about Brad Pfeiffer's work. Uh, and Brad is now uh, assistant professor at UT Southwestern. And I know he's always looking for good people. Um, and you heard a little bit about Ting Feng, who worked on some of the analysis of the slowing down sequences. And Delia Silva uh, and Ting worked on the preplay stuff. And then I briefly mentioned Haydar's work. And then this is like the new crew that came with me from Hopkins to Berkeley. And um, they're all very interested in um, you know, barriers and navigation and uh, problem solving by replay and things like that. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>